Hi everybody, it's Cookie Lou in Arizona. Um, I posted a little message on my Facebook about um, getting some news that my uncle had passed away. I don't know if I'm going to get through this, but I did want to take a time to honor him uh, by reading some of the stories in the, my memoir, Family of Pearls, that uh, he's his uh, stories about him and our life together. Uh, before I start, I don't know if I'm going to get through any of this, but I do want to ask you, my friends out there especially, uh, to honor me and him by going into my video library and looking up a video that I did November 11th, 2012. It was um, titled A Day of Remembrance. It was a tribute to Veterans Day where I uh, speak of my three uncles that went to, uh, to war and uh, when they received their draft letters and how my grandfather responded to it was funny and uh, about their individual uh, experiences. My uncle Carlo, um, there's a special uh, history with him as a sailor in the Navy. My uncle Herbie was in the Army. I believe he was stationed in France and my uncle Mondo was in Korea. He was the last one to get notified from the draft, and he was in Korea for two years as a combat soldier. So I do um, comment about their individual experiences. It's about a 30-minute video, but I especially would like you, you know, to honor me and my Uncle Armando. If you wanted to scroll on the timeline to eliminate the first two, uh, first two uh, go about maybe 13, 14 minutes, but if you scroll to 13.47 on the timeline, I started talking about Uncle Armando's experience as a soldier in Korea. And it's really good. Um, I'm very honored to say that I have written a very well written book. Um, the editing sucks <laughs> because I, you know, it's self published and uh, the stories in here are phenomenal. Uh, and this one here is something I'd like to share with all of you. So I'd appreciate it if you would look up A Day of Remembrance, November 11, 2012, is when it was posted. Uh, go to 13.47 and listen about uh, Uncle Armando. Now I have a few more stories here about him and I in my childhood. And I'm going to try to get through some of it. And if I can't, I apologize. I'm going to be weeping. Um, there's one little one here I'm going to start with. It's called The Lobsters. Armando was a very witty, humorous person. Uh, he was just so much fun to be around. And... Um, <laughs> He was uh, my favorite uncle. He was the one that always played with me, babysat me. My mother had to go out somewhere. And he was just fun and humorous and just a very dear soul. But I'm going to read you briefly, briefly about a little bit of a sense of humor here when I was growing up. Um, this situation happened after he came back from the war. After he came back from the war. But it's a, it was a dinner time, you know, every Sunday, you know, well, we all lived in grandma's house, you know, at a certain point in time before everybody got married and grew up and moved away. But uh, this was a Sunday, and uh, it's titled The Lobsters. And uh, I'll read it. Um, I remember sitting across from him, Armando, uh, at dinner one night when grandma placed a huge plate of boiled lobsters in the center of the table. The lobster meals were a rare and exotic treat for the family. Everybody oohed and odd as they grabbed the nutcracker from the pile on the table. Amanda started to tease me about how sometimes the lobsters could still be just a little bit alive and that I should watch out for a twitching antenna or snapping claw. I didn't like food with the head still on. And those lobsters scared me. I thought their little black eyes could see me sitting behind my plate at the table. I watched them laying there, all red and boiled, just daring me to grab a piece of them. Suddenly, Armando lunged forward out of his chair, yelling, There's a live one! Whack! Armando hit the lobster, with a, a, a lobster in the platter with a nutcracker, making it move. I jumped out of my seat. I, I don't want any. I cried with fear in my eyes. Vera tried, my Aunt Vera tried to comfort me and scolded Armando to stop fooling around. I believed him and swore I'd seen one move, <laughs> two, 
even before he hit it with the nutcracker. Nah, come on, Cookie, don't be afraid. I'm only kidding with you, he says. No, I don't want to eat any dinner tonight, I said, terrified. Armando took pity on me. He pulled a lobster tail out of, out of its shell and put it on my plate. I'm only kidding, Cookie. Eat it. It's good. Put some melted butter on it. I promise you, they're not alive anymore. I ate my piece of lobster with my eyes focused on that platter on the table, waiting for the slightest little flinch. Little things like that happens all the time. And then there's another story I'm going to read quickly it's called The Lost and Found. There were two times in my life when I got lost. Both times Uncle Migs found me and brought me back home. Uncle Migs is a mondo. Uh, that was his nickname. They called him Migs or Migsy. And I remember when he was a teenager, he said to my mother, Ma Nancy, I don't want to introduce myself as a mondo anymore. I want like a cool name. She says, well, tell everybody your name is Migs. He said, I don't like that. So he was mixed to all his friends. Okay, so Uncle Mix found me and brought me back home. I was in the first grade at St. Brendan's Catholic Church one day after school. I deliberately didn't get on the school bus because I wanted to walk home by myself. I didn't realize how far it was. I walked, I walked, I walked until I didn't know where I was anymore. I turned onto King's Highway thinking it was Avenue U. After a while, I stopped walking and started to cry. A woman asked me what was wrong. After asking for my name and phone number, which I proudly knew, she called the house from a payphone inside the store. Uncle Miggs answered the phone. And like my knight in shining armor, he rushed to my rescue in his blue and white convertible. He found me standing in front of the store with the woman who had telephoned him. He ran to me, scooped me up, and asked if I was all right. Then he drove me home as he scolded me for not getting on the bus. He told me I had done a dangerous thing. I could have been hurt or kidnapped by some crazy person and lost forever. It was a long drive home and as he put the fear of death, it was a long drive home as he put the fear of death into me. I learned a valuable lesson that day. I never missed the bus again. The next time I got lost, I really wasn't lost, just kind of forgotten about. My mother had registered me with a state funded summer vacation program for city kids. People living in the country offered kids an opportunity to vacation on their farm, so off to the rural station I went with my name tag pinned to my sweater. I joined other children of all ages and several chaperones who were traveling with us to the appropriate train stations where we were handed over to our assigned sponsors and brought us, who brought us to their farms. Truthfully, a very dangerous thing to do, <laughs> to hand your kid over to some stuff. <laughs> To some people, I mean, it was fine back then. These people were wonderful. They took good care of the, of the city kids that stayed at their farm. But, you know, I would never do that today. Okay. My mother felt it was a say. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> I'm laughing and crying at the same time here. Okay. Um, handed over to our assigned sponsors who brought us to their farms. It was a legitimate program. And apparently my mother felt it was a safe place to send me for two weeks to the fridge to have some fresh country air and something different to do. The two weeks passed quickly and I had a good time with the children I met. When the day came for me to go home, the farm sponsors drove me to the station and I went bye bye on the train. Though some break through some breakdown, breakdown in communication, my mother somehow had the understanding that I would be staying for another week. The sponsors claimed they knew nothing about that and put me on the train as scheduled. Nobody at home knew about my arriving home that day. I sat at Grand Central Station waiting for someone to come and get me, and no one showed up. Apparently, none of the chaperones traveling with the kids noticed that I was still there after everyone else had been re retrieved. I found myself sitting on a wooden bench in the heart of Grand Center with two Catholic nuns sitting on the other end, paying no attention to me. I had thought about approaching them, but I was shy, and my experiences with nuns had not been the best. <laughs> I went to Catholic school for a while. I felt someone touch my shoulder. A woman asked why I was sitting there all by myself. God bless people who notice lost children. I told her that nobody had come for me, so she called the phone number on my name tag. The phone rang and rang with no answer. Uncle Miggs was heading out the door, already late to meet up with friends. He didn't want to run back downstairs to answer the phone, but something told him that he should. He answered just before the woman hung up. Yeah, hello, hello, he answered impatiently. 
The voice on the other end of the phone asked him, is this the Muscarello residence? Yeah, it is. Who is this? My name is Mrs. Agnes Carter, and I have a little girl here in Grand Central Station, and she says her name is Cookie. But it says Lucille Albino on her name tag that she live at this residence. Cookie, yeah, that's my niece. Where are you calling from again? Grand Central Station? Grand Central Station? What the hell is she doing at Grand Central Station, he said. I don't understand. She's supposed to be in camp or someplace upstate. <laughs> the woman told him that she found me sitting all alone at the station. I was waiting there for hours and no one came to pick me up. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I can't believe this, he said. Nobody notified us that she would be coming home today. My uncle was so upset that I was all alone in such a big and confusing place that he panicked. Tell her not to cry. Tell her Uncle Mix is coming to get her. I'm leaving right now, right now to get her. I'll be there as soon as I can. He hung up the phone and flew up the stairs and out the door. Jumping into his blue and white convertible, he took off like a bat out of hell. He was furious and mumbling to himself. How the hell could anybody leave a little girl all alone like that? Such a crazy place. I swear, if I find out the jackets are left it there, I'll, I'll, I'll suddenly... Armando realized that in his panic to get to me, he forgot to ask the woman exactly where in Grand Central Station I was. He was on his way to rescue me and didn't have a goddamn clue where I was at the station. I sat on that bench for another long time before I finally saw the face of my frantic uncle in the crowd racing his way through Massive travelers looking for me. I screamed out his name with all I had in me. Uncle Mix! I was so glad to see him. I could tell from his long, tight hug that he was very glad to see me too. My wonderful Uncle Mixie, my hero in a blue and white convertible, always coming to my rescue. Um... How would I have survived my childhood without him? Thank you, Uncle Mix, for loving me that much, for always being there and showing up to save me. I was truly blessed to have grown up in a house where there was always a loving person there for me when I needed one. Me an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, I always knew I had the security of a relative to watch over me and be there for me in my mother's absence, no matter what. I counted on these people to be my safety harness, my knights in shining armor, and my guardian angels in high-heeled shoes. They never let me down that once. Okay, that's it about Uncle Mix. Please go to a day of remembrance and hear the story about my uncles who were soldiers and sailors. I think you, I know, you will really love it. And you will honor me and them and all the other soldiers when you listen to me read from my th a book uh, about a day of remembrance. So thank you all uh, for your sympathies on Facebook. I love you. Thank you.